to this month's webinar. I'm Derek Nolan. I'll be uh, running the webinar today on the topic is you want to sell your investment property but worry about the capital gains tax. So I thought it's a, I know with a with people who have investment properties, uh, prices have been going up a fair bit lately and there's a few people just asking me the question, if I was to sell my investment property, how much capital gains tax am I likely to pay? So as a as an avid investor myself, I have a number of properties, but I don't usually have to worry about capital gains too much because uh, as we get later in the slide, you only ever have to worry about capital gains tax if you sell a property. And anyone who knows me knows that I don't like don't like having to sell properties if you don't have to. So anyhow, we'll get started. Um, and uh, as I've got there, it may not be as much as you think. So that's what we're trying to uh, to show people today. There I am, Derek Nolan. I'm the business owner of 12 Chartered Accountants. If you don't know me, um, that's a fairly recent picture of me. And uh, we'll move, get right onto it. So today's webinar, what we're going to talk about is what is capital gains tax? And I've got a pretty, uh, pretty good de uh, description of, of what it is. Uh, secondly is how is capital gains tax included in your tax return? So basically, if you've made a capital gains, how do you pay tax on it? Third, I'm going to talk about some key points on particularly when you sell your investment property and what you need to consider. Third, I'm going to run through a number of examples. Now, this is where you're going to get most value today from what I'm doing is by you know working through some examples. Now, I'll try and keep it fairly basic, but you need to then sort of add your own um, own situation to that. And lastly, just some more important things to consider, um, you know, if you're thinking of selling a property in the future and what you need to maybe think about well before you actually do that. Okay, so let's get into it. What we're going to talk about is what is capital gains tax? Now, the way I answer that is fairly simple is there's no actual capital gains tax, believe it or not. You don't actually get a bill from the tax office called capital gains tax. Okay, um, what actually happens is you actually get included in your normal income tax return. Okay, so what I like to do is for all you visual spatial people out there, um, pretend your income tax return is like a bucket. Okay, now a lot of the examples I'm going, well actually all the examples I'm going to be doing today are all for individual people. I'm not going to be talking about capital gains tax inside of superannuation funds, uh, I'm not going to be talking about inside trusts or companies. Okay, A lot of the principles we talk about today can be applied to those, but today we're just talking about if you own a, tax, a personal uh, property and it's regarding your own personal income tax. Okay, So everyone's income tax return to me is like a bucket. Okay, So what you do is everyone's tax return, you have your, your income that goes into it, you have your salary, you have your dividends, you have your interest, you have parenting payment, there could be rental returns, there could be um, lots of different things that can go into your tax return. So say for example, you have all those things goes into the bucket, then the bucket gets all mixed around. So in your tax return, it doesn't matter whether it's salary or dividends or interest, it all gets swirled around. At the end of the day, you get your level in your bucket. And say for example, is uh, it's $80,000. So there's no distinction between your salary or your dividend or your interest in your income, it's all taxed the same, okay? So then what happens with a capital gain? is say the capital gain in this really simple example is $10,000. Now what happens is that, that $10,000 also gets put into your bucket, okay? So your taxable income then goes from 80,000 up to 90,000 and that's all gets swished around and that's the way your income tax then gets calculated. So therefore your tax is calculated on the whole amount of $90,000. In this case, the tax on $90,000 would be uh, $22,597, okay? So that's the crux of capital gains tax. There isn't actually, believe it or not, a capital gains tax. You don't get a bill. 
You don't do your income tax return and then once you sell your property, you don't then get a letter from the tax office saying, here, pay, pay your capital gains tax. A lot of people actually think that, which is a little bit surprising, but hopefully I've uh, made that fairly clear. Now, once you've got your bucket, now everyone, um, everyone who's a resident for Australian tax purposes has the same tax rates. Now, this is what the current 2016-2017 tax rates are. So, treat it like a bucket, like I did before, and whatever the level on your bucket is, that's the tax rate that you uh, apply. So, if you have happened to already be over the $87,000 taxable income, well, anything over $87,000 is going to be taxed at 37% plus Medicare. So you know that if you go and add your $10,000 capital gain and you're at 37% tax bracket plus Medicare, which makes it 38.5%, well, that $10,000 gain will actually cost you $3,850 because that keeps getting added to, to your bucket. Okay, so capital gains isn't just rental properties. It includes things like shares, units and unit trusts, if you sell your business, um, and obviously if you sell your property. Anything which is an asset is a capital gain. Now this is a very complex um, area of the tax legislation, and I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of it. I'll have another um, webinar one day on the sale of your business, um, and also um, touch on the sale of your shares as well um, for another day. But today we're just talking about property. And as I said at the very top, is you only need to worry about capital gains and capital gains tax if you sell something, okay? So don't sell anything. Well, it's not that simple as everyone understands, but that's until you actually sell something, you don't need to worry about having to pay tax. So some important things to consider uh, regarding the sale of investment properties. And the first one, and not many people understand this, the date of sale of the purchase is the actual contract signing date, not the settlement date. The tax office are really clear on this one, and that can be really important because um, you may actually exchange contracts in, say, May one year, but the settlement date may not be until July or August. So most people think, oh, that's fine. I don't need to include that capital gains until next year's income tax return because the settlement wasn't until next financial year. Well, that's not right. It actually needs to be included in this financial year on the date the contract was signed or exchanged, usually the same date. That's really important. However, it's actually worked in some people's favour because, oh, okay, because depending on what your income is for next year, it may be higher. So therefore, you might already have an overflowing bucket for next year, and you don't want to include it next year, but you prefer it this year. But, but that's really important to, to know that, and a lot of people don't, um, don't know that. Uh, second point I've got here, the gain, the capital gain, goes to the owner, the person on the title. So not the person with the mortgage, because there could be two people on the mortgage, but only one person's on the title or vice versa, there could actually be two people on the title and only one person on the mortgage. Forget about the mortgage, it's who's on the title. Now, a lot of people understand that on the title, it can either be tenants in common or joint tenants. Now, tenants in common is normally when two people own it equally. So if uh, me and my wife owned a property as joint tenants, I own 50 and Anita owns 50. But tenants in common, is a little bit different. You actually nominate your percentage, and that'll actually be on the title, that'll be on the front page. So you may have actually entered into a contract where um, for some reason uh, you were 90% and your spouse was 10%. May have been a, a good way because it was natively geared or something like that. But whoever's on the title needs to worry about the capital gains. And that's really important too when we start talking about companies and trusts and superannuation uh, funds and things like that. But today, we'll keep it nice and simple. A third point I've got here is it doesn't have to be an income producing property. You might actually have it as a holiday home 
or just a block of land. Um, it doesn't actually have to be something that is constantly in your tax return every year showing your rent and your expenses. Okay, so I've got there, it could be a home that your parents live in. It could be a holiday home, it could be a block of land, like all these things are not income producing. But they are still subject to capital gains tax when you sell them. Okay, you need to uh, be aware of that. And there's no rule of, about owning a property and having your parents live in it rent free. No rule about that. But when you sell it, you've got to pay the capital gains on the increase in value. Uh, and a really important one is prior to the 20th September 1985, which is starting to become a long time ago, um, that was when capital gains tax came in. I've actually made a typo there, I've got GST free, but it's actually capital gains tax free. So that's important. So if you actually bought a property and you've continually owned it for uh, since uh, before 985, you don't need to even worry about this webinar at all. You go and have a cup of tea now. All right, moving along to some of the examples. So let's talk about a really basic example here. Bruce has owns a property and he bought it back in 1st of December 1998 for $250,000. It has been a rental property for 100% of the time since. And then he goes and sells that property uh, on the 30th of September 2015 for $800,000. Now that sale, I'm assuming that's the date of exchange of contract. So that would go into his 2015-2016 income tax return. So just working on those numbers, so the calculation is his purchase price $250,000. Now what you can do is you add on to your purchase price your purchase costs. Uh, in most cases you always got your stamp duty, uh, in this case it might be $9,500, you've got your legal fees uh, at the time, but and for this example I'm just going to leave it at that. So his purchase um, price was $261,000. But those extra purchase costs could be a lot of things, particularly if um, you've been looking for a property for a while, you've been, you know, you, you know, you've flown to Brisbane, um, you've been to seminars, you've, you've done a lot of research, all those costs can actually go into your purchase price. Uh, so there might be a, quite a number of things to add on to that. But for this example, we're just going to go with those couple of simple things, purchase price 261. So the sale price is 800,000 and again that gets adjusted. In this case we're going to adjust it for agents fees, um, just round it to $20,000, um, some advertising costs, um, some legal fees again. So all those things, what actually does it reduces the sale price. So you might have got 800,000 for it but after those costs you only got a net 773. So what's Bruce's um, capital gains, well it is fairly simple, 773 minus 261. Now that's a capital gain of $512,000. Now most people would fall off their chair then because they're starting to see some fairly big numbers in front of them and they're starting to panic about how much tax they'll have to pay on that. So let's just go through the numbers. So again, let's go back to our bucket because this is how the capital gains tax is calculated. And let's assume that Bruce already had taxable income from salary and wages or dividend or interest or something like that of $80,000. So what we're going to do with him, we're going to go and whack $512,000 into his bucket. Okay. Now obviously that's not to scale and the bucket would probably be overflowing, but but let's assume that that's actually what's happened. Now the good thing for Bruce is there's a rule. And the rule is if a property is owned more than 12 months, you only pay half, you will only half the gain is included in your taxable income. Now that's a good thing. Now what used to happen in the old days, it used to be indexed to inflation. Now everyone knows that $250,000 in 1998, is worth a lot more than $250,000 is now. So it used to be where it used to be indexed to inflation. 
Um, so if you, you know, you know, whatever the CPI rate was. So after a while, they thought, well, that's that's just an annoying. Let's just make it that um, it's it's just a half um, of the gain. So that's actually what happens. So for Bruce, not 512, it's actually $256,000 gets added to his bucket, okay? So his taxable income then for 2000, sorry, uh, 2016 is $326,000. So if you were to do the calculation on that, um, tax on the $80,000 was 18747 Now we're going to add that um, $256,000 to it. Um, so the, his taxable income now is $326,000. Now tax on that is $126,767. So he'll actually get a bill from the tax office of $126,767, well that will be his taxable um, uh, calculation. So therefore the difference between the original one and the, um, the adjusted one is $108,020. So effectively that $108,000 is attributable to the capital gain and that's the extra amount. So if he's going and sells his property for $800,000, he needs to put $108,000 of that income aside to pay his capital gains uh, when he lodges his tax return. Not when he sells a property, but when he lodges his tax return. Okay, so that was a fairly straightforward example. I'm going to do a, a second example here. This one is uh, a couple, Paul and Mary. Now, the numbers are exactly the same. So this was owned jointly, so they purchased the property uh, back in 98 for 250,000, rented out for the whole thing, a whole period of time and sold for 800,000. Exactly the same numbers. So without going through all the calculations again, there it is, the gain is $512,000. So what happens there though is we've got two buckets, okay? So rather than the whole, and this is after the 50% um, discount um, for owning the property for more than 12 months, we've only got $128,000 going to each of the buckets. So what actually happens is the 512 gets split uh, and they're divided by two people and we've only got $128,000 on top of the $80,000 to deal with. So the gain then is, so we've got here, prior to the gain, we've got um, the two people had $80,000 each. Tax on that is total to $37,494. Once it gets split, um, the tax is 142, 614, so therefore, the increase becomes 105,120. So again, it's slightly better than the $108,020, not massively, um, but that can be a lot better depending on your situation. Jane, for example, may not be working and may not have any income. So her $128,000 would be taxed much, much less. So in this example here, it wasn't a significant savings, but it was a savings, uh, but it could be a lot better, could be a lot worse as well. But um, it just shows by splitting the income, if you have that opportunity, um, you will actually pay a little bit less tax. The example is more about actually the mechanism and how it actually works. Let's go on to a third example. Again, this is Jason, must be a friend of Bruce. Same situation, purchased the property in 98 for 250, but the difference was he lived in the house. So he lived in this property up until the 1st December 2009. Then he rented it until he sold it in 2015 for 800,000. So the example is exactly the same, except for that period of time where he lived in it and the period of time that he rented it. So Jason's got a few methods to calculate his capital gain. Now the first of those, um, again we're talking about exactly the same gain. So it's got a, a taxable gain of 512. I don't go through the same calculations but but that's what it came to. So the first thing is we, we calculate on a pro rata basis. Okay, so the first method, we call it method A, we'll do a pro rata. So he's owned it for 202 months. I actually do it in months, it's a lot easier to calculate than fractions of years. So the period that he actually rented it for 
was from the 1st of the 12th, 2009 to the 30th of 9th. So that was actually 70 months. So this could actually work in reverse. You could have actually um, rented at first and lived in at second. That's the same calculation on the same pro rata basis. So therefore, the percentage of time that was rented is 70 months divided by the 202, which actually comes to 34.65% of the time. So guess what? Very simple calculation. The taxable gain is then 34.65% of the 512. Okay, so only 177,408 is the taxable gain. So we go back to uh, Jason's bucket. Everyone loves my buckets. And again, let's just assume, like Bruce, his income already in the bucket was $80,000. And we go and now add $177,000 of capital gains to his bucket, as you can see. But as we talked about, only half of it is taxable because he's owned the property for more than 12 months. So therefore, go and replace that with $88,000 worth of capital gains. So now his taxable income is 168704 If we flow that through to our tax calculation, again, uh, the difference between the 18000 which originally was, and the 52583 with the, the capital gain added on, is a total difference of $33,836. So that's what his gain, not 108 where Bruce was, uh, because of that pro rataing he only has a capital gains of $33,836, which is pretty good. But there's more. Let's look at method B. Method B is the market value method. Now the tax office allow you to um, um, do this. So there's the same um, calculations, same dates. Um, what we'll do is the market value on this day mean the 1st of the 12th, 2009. So the day that it was rented, Jason went and got a market value appraisal. Now a lot of people will have that done because they're obviously probably buying another house and therefore the bank have got a market value or you just happen to get one anyhow. What actually happens is there's people out there, I think it's BMT and a few other companies like that will actually go and give you a market value appraisal even though you didn't get one at the time. So it's not the end of the world if you haven't got one of these. So let's take this example where um, 1st of December 2009, the market value of that product was actually $720,000. So all the increase in value actually happened in that first period when Jason was living in the house. So the theory behind this is that she, Jason should only pay tax on the bit of property increase that, that increases value since it was rented. So again, what we look at there is a straight calculation between the market value of $720,000, less his selling price, which has been adjusted for his selling prices, remember, $773,000. We don't adjust it for the purchase price um, costs, the stamp duty and things like that, because that's not the way it works. So in this case, Jason only is up for a capital gain or a taxable gain of $53,000, because only the straight difference between the market value and the selling price. So what happens is, back to the bucket, um, he's got his $80,000, what we're going to stick in his capital gain is only $53,000. So again, taking the 50% deduction, or the, only half the gain, only $26,500 goes into his bucket as a capital gain. So his taxable income, he's adjusted, is only $106,500. So we go to the calculation now, the difference is only $9,888. That's his additional tax on top of the capital gains. So the way it works is, you get to choose which method. How good's that? So you're not locked in to say, oh, we're, we're going to use the pro rata method um, or we're going to use the market value method. So what you do, and when I sit down with my uh, clients every year, we go through the different calculations and we go, well, 
it's a no-brainer. Method B is the one we're going to use. Okay, so I much prefer to pay nine thousand eight eighty-eight as opposed to thirty-three thousand dollars. That's a no-brainer, and that's the way it works. But there's more, and let's move on to method C. Method C again, exactly the same situation um, for for Jason, but Jason did not live in the house that he owned during the period the house, I oh, did not live in the house that was owned, oh, I'll say that again. Jason did not live in the house that he owned during the period the house was rented. Okay, so Jason's moved out and he might have moved back with his parents. He might have moved into with some friends place, but it's important that the house that he moved into, he didn't own. Okay, really important that, okay? And he continued to rent this house until he sold it in um, 2015. The calculation on that is the ATO allows taxpayers six years from when they move out of their principal place of residence to consider that property as their principal place. So basically what it is, the capital gain is zero because you're allowed six years to sell that property, okay? Now this all comes um, from when people were being sent to work in certain places. Say, say you um, work for a company, they send you to Perth to work for two years. And in that two year period, you decide to rent your house out because there's no point selling because you know you'll be back in two years. So you do that, rent it out, get some income, negatively gear it if you can, but then in two years time you come back kick the tenants out and you move back into it. A few years time, you sell it. Now, you've actually got a potential capital gains there. So the tax officer said, well, that's not fair. What we'll do is allow people six years to move out of their house, as long as they go, don't go and buy another property and go and live in it. It's funny, you can actually own another property as long as you don't live in it, okay? And then as long as you move back into that property within six years, there's no capital gains. And the, the even better part of it, this six year rule can be refreshed, which means if you move out of it, your property, move back into it within that six year period, your six year starts again if you move out again. Okay, so I've got a few clients of actually doing this. They actually, after about five and a half years, they make sure that they move back into their rental property or at least make it look like they move back into their rental property, and then they move out again. And they may only have to live in it for a, a few weeks. And then the six year is refreshed. So they continue to make sure that their rental property will never uh, be subject to capital gains. Now there's a few other rules, I'll get to that in a sec, but basically if that's your situation and um, the taxable gain looks pretty sweet at zero, okay? So what happens is you're able to choose the method. In this case, A, B, or C. Well, C is a no-brainer, but that may not be applicable to everyone. And also, in this ex in situation, the market value um, may have been a lot less back in 2009, so actually part, uh, method B may have actually given you a higher number, but it just works out either way. So other important things to consider. Um, I'll just run through these fairly quickly. If you inherit a property, you've actually got two years to sell that property and there's no capital gains. So if you inherit it and the market value is $500,000 and then in two years time it's gone up to $600,000 and you sell it, within two years of you inheriting it, there's no capital gains. But if you wait for two years and one day and sell it, unfortunately, you're up for the capital gains. They sort of think, well, two years should be long enough to work out what you're going to do with this property. Important to note. The depreciation claimed in tax returns, like they're the things like if you've got, um, you know, the normal things like carpets and curtains and fittings, all that being depreciated, but also the, land, the, the, the actual building, uh, the 2.5%. Uh, that everyone's uh, probably aware of. Um, when you sell your property, that has to be added back to the capital gains, okay? A lot of people forget that, okay? So if you might have bought it for $250,000 and over the next 10, 15 years, you depreciated it by $50,000, what happens is you've got to 
say, well, that $50,000 comes off my purchase price. So my capital gains calculation doesn't start at 250 and now starts at 200. A lot of people forget that. So even though you're taking a deduction year after year, it actually burns you a little bit when you go and sell the, um, the property, okay? Um, third one, all expenses not claiming your tax return is added to your costs. All right, so if there are other expenses you've had along the way that you haven't put in your tax return and claimed, and there probably won't be too many if it has been rented all the time, but there might be a period of time where it actually wasn't rented. There might be some things that you've spent money on like uh, renovations that you actually haven't claimed as a deduction. You might be depreciating them or you might just not claim them at all. All those things get added onto the cost. Okay, A lot of people may not actually have it as a rental property. It might just be land or it might just be a holiday home or it might be a home that your parents are living in. So all those costs associated with that property, uh, council rates, water rates, interest, all those things get added onto the cost of the property, which of course then reduces your capital gain significantly. Really good to, so even though you're not claiming as a rental property over all the years, it's really good to keep all those costs anyhow, because that comes off your capital gain. Another important thing, and we're getting more and more of this, the ATO will know when you sell. Their data matching process is increasing, so they know. We've had a few clients where didn't put the capital gains um, when they sold a property in their tax return, and sure enough, the tax office um, wrote them a letter and uh, <clears throat> asked if they'd like to um, amend their tax return. Very interesting though, those few people that actually had that, what the ATO actually did was they took 10% of the selling price. So say for example, that you didn't put in your tax return, the tax office wrote to these particular clients and said, all right, listen, we know that you sold this property for 800,000. We know you even bought it for 250,000 because it doesn't take that long for us to find out this information. Now, if you don't do anything, we're gonna take the gain between the 800,000 and the 250 and include it as a taxable income in your tax return. But we're gonna be fair. We're gonna take 10% of the selling price, which is $80,000, and include that as the adjustment. So the adjustment includes you know, all the stamp duty and the legal fees and the agent's fees and all that sort of stuff. So in our ex actual example, that works out um, pretty well. Actually, I'll just go to that example now and show you. This is Bruce's example, example number one. So imagine what we do there is he's got his purchase price 250 and his sale price 800. What they do, is they just take an ATO 10% allowance of $80,000. So the difference then is between 250,000 and 720. This is what they do, this is exactly what they do. They say, if you don't amend your tax return, this is what we're gonna do in your tax return. So his gain, Bruce's gain is only $470,000. Um, go back to his bucket, which we did before, and go and whack that $470,000 in there, um, what actually happens is the taxable income is $315,000. Do the calculation on that, it actually comes to 102,905, which believe it or not, is better than the original calculation of $108,020. Very, very interesting. However, what happens is the tax officer will go, oh yeah, plus there's penalties, and they'll normally hit you with a penalty of at least 25% because of non-disclosure. So don't just go, oh listen, I'm not going to worry about it, I'll let the tax office do my dirty work for me. It doesn't work. Just thought I'd throw that one in because that's the mentality of the tax office at the moment, is they're trying to be fairly fair, but they will know about the sales. Okay. A few other important considerations. Uh, you can only nominate one person, one property, to be your principal place of residence. However, if you're living in a property you own, that must be the nominated property, okay? So if you uh, live in a property, the your principal place of residence is always exempt for capital gains tax purposes. That's really important. So if you move out, you can still nominate that property as your principal place of residence. Fantastic. You only ever have one though. Say though, if you own a couple of other properties um, 
And the one over here is actually looking at a much bigger capital gain. If you were to sell it, you may actually be wise to go and nominate that one as your principal place of residence as opposed to this one here because you only ever be in one place at a time. But if you actually happen to be living in one that you own, that has to be it. Hope everyone gets that. If you've got a few questions, ask me about that one because it's really important about which one you nominate as your principal place of residence. The next point is always a favourite of mine. Everyone always asks me about this one. Husband and wife can only have one principal place of residence property together. They can't have one each. Okay, don't try and argue the point. That's what the tax office are really clear on. Okay, so um, yeah, come up with different plans, but that's the way they do it. There's also the last little point I'll add. There's a two hectare rule for principal place of residence. So if you actually own a property that is a non-primary uh, production property, you only allowed two hectares of that property to be nominated your principal place of residence. So if you've got a 20 hectare property, you know, one nice little rural retreat with a couple of horses on it, um, you have to nominate two of those 20 hectares to be your principal place of residence and have that valued separately. So even though you sell that property and you think, wow, all this um, capital gain free will actually only two hectares of it. Now what you of course you do if you are smart is you'll nominate the two hectares with the, with the house on it. And the other 18 has just got um, trees and grass on it. And you get the value separately. So someone come and say, well, per hectare it's worth so and so, so therefore that is a lot less than two hectares that you've actually sold. But a lot of people don't know that either. Really important. I think that's it. I've got through. Um, I was trying to keep it to uh, 30 minutes and I almost did that so. But with this whole um, um, property and selling, um, people just will need to know. Usually you'll come and see after you've already sold it. You know, oh, by the way, how much tax do I have to pay? The smart ones ask me that question well before it's actually done. Because if they don't understand how all those examples worry about how much they are going to But there could be an exception, there could be a market value rule, there could be a six year rule thing that just absolutely makes it hard to get it all. And everyone gets pretty happy about knowing that. And they can say, listen, if I can sell this property now, knowing that I'm not going to smack you know, like, in a great way, I can get that as tax It's just understanding. So, again, email me, Facebook, me, I don't know what it is. The easiest thing, of course, is just to email me at info.world.com. Okay, last thing to plug our next webinar, which will be in April, towards April. And this one's on payroll tax. So, again, this is going back to a small business owner. So, anyone who's listening up there who runs their business, this is really, really important. It's a tidal wave that's approaching uh, rapidly. I've been through a couple of payroll tax audits recently and they're horrendous. So if you're a small business owner, um, you need to listen to this one. Coming up on 12th April at 12. All right, well, thank you very much for listening uh, today and uh, goodbye for now.